so just a couple words about myself. I'm a professor in management science and engineering. Uh, my interests are mainly in market design, networks, and uh, microeconomic theory. Um, I've been lucky enough, actually, this is my second uh, go around with Media X. I was lucky enough right after I started to uh, have a grant to look at network effects in online services. Um, today what I wanted to talk to you about is sort of the next phase of things I'm going to work on. Um, the title here, The Engineer is Economist, is actually a riff on the title of a paper that Al Roth, uh, the Nobel Prize winner in economics this year, wrote uh, called The Economist as Engineer. And that paper was actually entirely about the fact that we have an unprecedented ability to engineer markets in a way that we could never uh, do before. So that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, so let's start, oh, that's unfortunate. The picture doesn't really show up too well. Um, let's start with traditional markets. You know, markets are obviously an ancient design. And uh, th this here is, th the typical picture for a slide like this would be the Agora in Athens, but I've used that enough that I wanted something different. So this is Trajan's market in Rome. And, um, you know, the typical features of these markets are, first of all, that the institution itself changes on a very slow time scale. As you can imagine, if you've built the infrastructure, it's kind of hard to change that quickly. Um, and the other thing is that the information that's available to you about what's happening in the market is relatively limited. So this means that questions like, you know, who should you trade with, who are your competitors, how much should you charge or pay for what you're selling or buying, those are questions that are typically hard to answer uh, because of the, of the limits on the information available to you in, in the marketplace. Right? But, you know, one of the things that we're seeing in the last decade especially, but a trend that's really accelerating, I think, in the last few years in terms of the number of niches it's touching, is the rise of um, what I'm going to call the online market platform, all right? And these examples range from marketplaces for goods, so things like, you know, the largest example would be eBay, but Etsy is a really interesting example for, for crafts and, and homemade goods. Um, sponsored search markets, Google and Bing. Labor markets such as Odesk, um, so uh, partly this is, uh, I guess, self-promotion. I'm on sabbatical at Odesk this year, um, working on uh, design of online, online platforms. Um, and TaskRabbit, which is more of a physical uh, local labor market. And many others, um, the App Store and Google Play we'll come back to. Um, Uber is a, you know, one, of, one example of a, uh, uh, a market for transportation, um, uh, for cabs and, and cars. And Kickstarter, which uh, many of you I'm sure have heard of as a, as a marketplace for entrepreneurship. So how do online markets change this traditional mechanism from you know, what we've been used to for so many years? In, in my view, at least, I think, it, th these two challenges, these two features of traditional markets that I mentioned earlier are the things that become tremendous opportunities. So the first one is that in traditional markets, as I said, you have a relatively inflexible institution that can't evolve nearly as quickly, whereas with online market platforms, you have an unprecedented ability at a fine grain to engineer the matches that take place between market participants, okay? The second thing is that after the matching is completed or after transactions are completed, we also have an unprecedented ability to mine the fine-grained information that's produced from those interactions. Both the process of matching itself, you know, so how well did I do in advertising the, the right, you know, let's say, goods for you to bid on on eBay, but also how happy you were after the transaction took place. So you hire a contractor on Odesk, how well did the contract go? Were you happy with the experience? Were you unhappy with the experience? So these are things that we really didn't have the ability to observe in, in any serious capacity before. And I think that we haven't completely appreciated the way in which economics changes when you have the ability to engineer the market. So that's really what I'm excited about and really interested in um, moving forward. Um, so I want to just quickly run through challenges both for the market designer and for the market participant. Uh, for both parties, I think there's a lot of really interesting questions that come up. Two challenges in particular I wanted to focus on for the market designer are the nature of the matching and the nature of the information related to the opportunities that I described on the previous slide. So when I say centralized or decentralized matching, what I mean is how much should you intervene in the matches that take place? Um, to give you an idea, <clears throat> if you've ever used Uber, then you know that the way that Uber works is that there's an iPhone app and you, you pull up the app and um, essentially where you are, you, know, you say, I'd like a car, and they send a car. And you really don't see a list of 10 drivers you might want to choose from. You don't get to see where you know, the 10 nearest cars are, which one would you like to come to you. There's essentially no choice other than I would like a car. 
So that's a very centralized marketplace because they're the ones engineering almost the entire matching process between you and the person who's going to pick you up. At the other extreme, you have marketplaces like Odesk, which are very, very decentralized in terms of how much they intervene in the match that actually takes place between the client and contractor. Even there, there's intervention simply because you can't possibly look at all of the contractors that are available on the site. You have to, Odesk has to make some decisions when you search for, let's say, a PHP developer. Which ones will we show you? So even that is engineering and intervening in the matching process. But beyond that, we essentially allow the matches to, to form organically between clients and contractors. So there's a real tension here. Centralization and decentralization both have advantages and disadvantages. And really, just to say that quickly, centralization has the advantage that if you think you know what the matches should be, then you have the opportunity to essentially implement them directly. And uh, many of the markets that Al Roth has had a huge impact in designing have this feature. Uh, things like the National, Resident uh, National Medical Resident Matching Program. You know, it's a very centralized matching process. Um, on the other hand, decentralization has the advantage that if you don't know what the personal preferences are of the participants, what kind of contractor does this client want? What kind of work does this contractor want to do? Then decentralization has the feature that it allows the parties to express that information efficiently in many cases and, and form matches that reflect their preferences. It's very hard to make that trade-off, and I, I mean, there is no right answer to that, and that's part of what makes the problem so interesting, is that depending on the market, you may have a very different place that you land on that continuum. Uh, the second challenge is very similar, opacity and transparency. You, you have a choice between showing a lot of information to the market participants or very little. Now again, the theory, you know, as, as it's painted to us from sort of 50 years ago, you know, general equilibrium and economics and so on would say, more information should help make markets more efficient. But the problem here is that um, more information has a, a significant cognitive burden on the market participant, right? So imagine a very decentralized market where I just say, hey, you, I'll just show you everything. No filtering, nothing. It's up to you. Go search for whatever you want. Me, you know, I, I feel like we moved from a Web 2.0, where it was great to have a lot of information, to sort of a Web 3.0, which is where there's a new friction. The search friction has been replaced by a cognitive friction. Before, I couldn't find enough people to trade with. Now, I don't know who I should trade with among the millions of people you're showing me. And so I think it's not so obvious that tra full transparency is the right solution when it comes to information in these online marketplaces. And that, again, is very interesting. It's a very new and different challenge from the kinds of challenges you might have traditionally thought about in, in Trajan's market in Rome. Um, so similarly, on the other side, there's lots of interesting challenges for market participants in these kinds of markets, again, because the match is being engineered at a finer grain and because the information available to them about the quality of the matches they, 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 uh, they entered into is of a finer grain. So um, you know, here I won't dwell as much, but Essentially, you, you can think of the, the canonical problem for a market participant as, what is my optimal strategy for X? All right? And X might be finding trading partners. So what's the best way to search through this online market platform that you gave me for the trades to make? It's interesting to think that these are problems that range from the individual looking for something to buy on eBay to the algorithmic trader deciding what prices to enter bids and offers on you know, into a limit order book for financial securities. Those problems actually share a lot in common from an algorithmic perspective, even though they were modeling very, very different, uh, very, very different types of decisions. Um, pricing goods to sell, I think, is one of the most compelling problems here, and, and certainly probably one that's of a lot of interest to people in this room. You know, if you are a merchant entering an online market, the availability of this information on a very rapid time scale really changes the nature of the pricing problem and the exploration problem. Um, bidding on goods to buy, again, sort of the same thing on the procurement side. So I just want to close by uh, sort of giving one example of a market that I've gotten quite interested in. And, and really here, I have to give a lot of credit to my postdoc, Barr, uh, who's sitting in the back. Um, so Barr was a PhD student at Columbia in the business school and then came to work with me this year. And um, what we got excited about is to look at the economics of the market for mobile apps. And I guess, you know, this is a great example of a, a, you know, a tectonic shift in the nature of market interactions. There's tremendously fast feedback um, on, the, on the sales uh, that, that you make in the App Store and, and Google Play in response to the prices that you set. And so Barr's really been looking at data to understand how developers should price their apps. 
Um, you have the opportunity for rapid experimentation, you have the opportunity, you, but you have the, the challenge of stiff competition for visibility. And so the, the project that he's looking at is a data-driven study to understand how you form optimal marketing and pricing strategies within this type of a marketplace. So actually that single poster that's up there uh, right now is, is um, Barr's poster. Uh, you're welcome to take a look and talk to either him or me uh, more about that. But, um, you know, so more broadly speaking, this is something I expect to devote, you know, much of the next five years of my own research to. Uh, certainly much of what I've done before touches on this in various ways, but I don't think I fully appreciated the extent to which this is a really a new frontier in, in how we think about economics that has the chance to really, um, I think, change both economics and engineering in a fundamental way. So, thank you. <laughs>